Pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to talk about bending the curve. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. Uh, I'll share that with you in a moment. And the idea here is that I'm really trying to connect with practitioners. I spend a lot of time hanging out with other knowledge generators, but there's all sorts of folks on the front lines, folks that work in environmental consulting, folks that work in regional governments, conservation authorities, provincial, territorial governments, and federal governments, and so on. These are the frontline workers, if you will, when it comes to the environmental crises that we face. Yeah, there's science that's being done in the background, but it's the folks that are really on those front lines that, that are making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that, that really have pretty serious outcomes uh, for our aquatic ecosystems. Sometimes those are really small decisions that are made at the desk or at the riverbank. Other times they're things that get punted up to headquarters, some of those bigger files. So just wanted to, just going forward. Uh, just wanted to start off with a, you know, getting everybody in a, a slightly downer mood, but we'll, we'll try and turn that around. So just a few quick stats here. A reminder that globally freshwater wetland extent has declined by about 70% since the 19, uh, early 1900s. The extinction rate in freshwater ecosystems is equal to that of tropical rainforests, uh, which we clear cut and burn, so that, that can't be good. Uh, and one third or so of the, the approximately 28,000 species that are dependent upon freshwater habitats thus far assessed are threatened with extinction. When we start to look at, at freshwater fish specifically, they have the highest extinction rate among vertebrates, uh, almost 900 times higher than background rates here in, in North America. And then we just had this uh, fantastic report that came out from the WWF uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, we've got 80 freshwater fish around the world already extinct. We've seen a 77% decline in freshwater migratory fish and a 90% decline in iconic megafish. Now, if we, if we look at the global uh, WWF Living Planet Index uh, and focus on, on, this isn't just fish, by the way, uh, you see the, the little light blue there. This is for freshwater uh, uh, animals. And you can see there that we've got an 83% decline for 2016. I think it was 86 or 87 for, for 2018. So this is the curve, okay? It is a curve going in the wrong direction. We're doing much more poorly in freshwater than we are in marine or, or terrestrial systems, but it continues to go down. So this is that that downward trend or downward curve. And when I talk about bending the curve, it's about trying to to uh, we don't just want to stop it. That, that's insufficient. It's about how do we bend it up and rebuild biodiversity. If you think that this seems very distant, that I'm talking about something global, sure, this is being driven with what's happening in, in the Mekong or the Amazon. Well, the same thing's happening right here in Canada. We've got uh, the Lake Ontario uh, Fish Living Planet Index. And so in 2014, it was down 32% relative to uh, 1992 values. We had the fantastic WWF Canada watershed report that came out re recently. First of all, there's uh, you know, the majority of watersheds, sub watersheds in Canada, we don't actually know how they're doing. And 24 of the 67 that were assessed scored fair to poor. So certainly lots of work to be done right here at home. And then this is something that we're, I'm working on with uh, a number of collaborators and, and led by uh, a number of students in my, uh, in my lab. And of the 2,791 or so freshwater dependent species in Canada, we've identified that 28% of them are at risk and 38% are data deficient. So again, this isn't just a problem on the other side of the world or in the global south. This is real and it's happening right here before our eyes. There are lots of threats, lots of drivers here, and we can go back and think of David Dudgeon's classic paper from 2006. We have recently updated that in a paper led by Andrea Reed, and there's lots of things that are, are happening. Uh, I wanna in particular point, uh, point out L. So it's, it's just at the top there beside A, and that's cumulative stressors. None of this is happening in a vacuum. All of these things are layered on top of each other, and it's not getting better.
So uh, that's a picture of Georgina Mace. She passed away this past fall, uh, an incredible leader in the conservation science world. And she's the one that came up with this idea of bending the curve. And so what we've seen through the 1970s are all of these global efforts, like the Convention of Biological Diversity, COP6, Aichi targets, and so on. And we continue to see that decline, that loss of biodiversity. And then we need to decide what we want to do as society, whether we want to just keep following that trend down, whether we want to try and level it off, or if we start working to do what we can to bend that curve up. So what are curve bending activities? Now, specific to freshwater, a number of, of us came together uh, under the leadership of WWF Global in London a couple of years ago, and we developed what we called an emergency action plan. It was published in, in Bioscience, if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet. And here's one of the figures from the, the paper. So we've got that current trajectory. We want to implement this emergency recovery plan. And here are the six parts of the plan. It's, it's things that all of you are going to look at and say, duh, of course. Now, these are really high level things, things that, that international governments and, and organizations can kind of bite into. But if you're a frontline practitioner, how do you actually do these things? How does this translate into actual action on the ground? Because that's what we need. We need every practitioner working with every stakeholder and partner and rights holder they can to make this happen. So how can we empower the frontline, uh, our frontline workers, if you will, to, to make that happen? And so as I, I noted, most of these actions are, are done by on the ground practitioners, yet this emergency action plan is so high level, it's frankly not helpful. So it's about getting you a toolbox to make it easier for you to do your job and make sure that that toolbox is equipped with the best available knowledge. What we know from all sorts of social science work that's been done is that decision makers, whether we're, you know, and I'm not just talking about people working at headquarters, but folks that are, are on the ground, you use your personal contacts as your primary source of science-based science information. So we call that cross-cubicle communication. If you want a, a suggestion on how to address a problem, you're gonna ask your neighbor and what are they gonna do? They're gonna reinforce what, what you already know. They're going to reinforce those institutional traditions. And we are not making full or systematic use of the entire evidence base. So how do we make that happen? You do not have time to be trolling the library when you are a frontline practitioner. So what we're doing with funding from SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, is developing a toolbox that's specific to restoring freshwater biodiversity in Canada. The team includes a, a handful of academics and a, a variety of partners embedded in different government uh, agencies and, and other relevant organizations. And the outputs, we're developing a website. We've got a meeting with uh, Aquatic Habitat Canada on Monday. Uh, they will likely be housing this, this output put, uh, we'll obviously write a, a science article, scientific article or two, and we're going to develop some videos. And this is all in the process of coming together right now. Uh, and so what does this toolbox look like? We're assembling a list of all the relevant freshwater biodiversity interventions. So this extends beyond fish. Uh, we're searching for existing evidence syntheses. Evidence syntheses are what, where all those different studies are brought together to give you the big signal in terms of what works and what doesn't. Now there's different reliability of those, those syntheses. Some lit reviews are extremely biased and others are extremely rigorous. So we're scoring those. And then we're also scoring the syntheses based on their relevance to the Canadian context. So for example, if there's a review on how to recover endangered uh, amphibians, and it's based solely on tropical regions, it might not have a whole lot of relevance to Canada. So that would be something that would get, get rated low in terms of, of relevance to a Canadian context. Whereas something coming out of say, say Scandinavia, looking at restoration in, in sort of North temperate regions for fish populations might be highly relevant. We're then developing a database that will list all those available tools and the ratings uh, and extent and to which the evidence syntheses are both reliable and re relevant to our Canadian context. And we're hoping this will give practitioners what they need while also identifying the key evidence gaps that we as scientists need to address. And so as I wrap up here, this is my last slide. We need your help. 
Uh, it's nice to sit back and write a paper called the emergency action plan, publish it in a nice journal, get some citations. But at the end of the day, that is, that is a failure if it is not embraced by the frontline practitioners. We need you and we need to support you. So what impedes your ability to engage in curve building activities and how can the science community better support practitioners? Hopefully these are discussions that we can have during the question and answer session. Thanks a bunch.